what this shader actually does is uh, it translates uh, the movement of surface points in camera space into color values. That means if a point on the sphere moves a certain amount of pixels in any direction between two frames, it gets a specific color value. A red channel represents the movement in horizontal axis and green channel in vertical one. If a point doesn't move in a particular axis, it gets a value of 0 0.5. If it does move, uh, then it gets values higher or lower than 0 0.5. That depends on the direction of the movement. That way, values of 0 or 1 represent the maximum possible displacement of surface points in the frame. Uh, the actual pixel value to become a maximum is uh, defined by the normalized attribute of lm to dmv shader. If we go to Render Menu, Render Current Frame Option Box and set verbosity level to at least Info Messages and then re-render the frame. Uh, in Output Window at the very bottom we can see the maximum amount of displacement the shader has found in this frame. In this case it's 11 pixels. Um, back then, to ensure the best distribution of values in 8-bit image, uh, we had to set uh, this normalized value to something really close to that max displays, uh, so that the fastest movement uh, produces color values close to 0 or 1, like that. These days, uh, we can render our images with 16 or even 32-bit precision. Uh, so the only thing we need to make sure is uh, that normalized value is always larger than that uh, max displays in our scene. Otherwise, fast movement would get clipped. We can change uh, the bit depth in render settings, mental ray quality tab, uh, frame buffer folder data type. We have got RGBA short, RGBA half, and RGBA float. The one you choose depends on the image format. I'll set it to half and image format to open EXR. A pretty safe method to set uh, this uh, normalized attribute is to uh, input the largest dimension of the render resolution. In this case, it's 640. So let's input that. Uh, actually, let's uh, reanimate our sphere a bit so that it has a pretty fast movement. It will travel from this corner to this corner in one frame. Pre-render. Now we have a much larger value. But we are still safe because we've set uh, normalized uh, attribute to 640. Uh, obviously, these values uh, depend on uh, render resolution. If we keep uh, the same motion but render it with, uh, let's say, uh, film 2048 by 1556, we'll get a much higher values here. So we need to update normalized value accordingly. Same method, 2048. And now everything is good. Uh, there could be cases when this method won't work that well. Let's say we've got a really fast movement of the sphere. 
I'll reanimate it once again. Now it will move right here and re-render the frame. Now we have a huge values and the, they are clipped. In uh, such situations you just need to test your frames and uh, figure out uh, the values you need to input uh, manually. And one more thing to keep in mind. Since we sample the motion from the beginning of the frame towards the next one, we need to have a continuous animation after the last frame. Let's change our scene again. Now the sphere will move from this side to this side. And let's set normalized value to something low just to see the values. Let's set it to 20. So in frames from 1 to 23, we've got a nice values. But in the last frame, suddenly we have a static sphere, zero pixels. Uh, that's because there is no change in uh, sphere position from uh, frame 24 to frame 25. So we need to set another key in the frame 25 or a useful method, we can go to the graph editor and for animation curves you infinity and enable curves post infinity linear. Uh, that way uh, the sphere will continue to move after this uh, keyframe in 24th frame like that. And now we'll have a proper motion vectors calculated in the frame 24. So enough of that sphere theory, let's put it to some real use.